think I just sent you the co-host. Okay. <laughs> hey, so in the jumbo John, I put in the thread of the previous spaces of the reading, and then Here I'm going go. to let me find a PDF of what. I'm going to go ahead and start reading and not going to, I won't be looking at the screen. So. Uh, I'm starting off where it says 13, loving. And the quote is from George Jackson's Soledad brother. All women, even the very phenomenal, want at least a promise of brighter days and bright tomorrows. I have no tomorrows at all. And that was a quote from George Jackson. The section is called Loving. I'm reading Huey P. Newton's Revolutionary Suicide. There's previous recordings of this, of the previous chapters, and it's in the Jumbotron. Loving. My relationships with women could be described as complex or strange, depending on how you look at them. Varying influences helped to form my attitude. The influence of my parents, of Christianity, of my older brothers, and later my reading and the theories of Richard Thorne. Because these influences were often contradictory, they led to certain conflicts in my feelings and involvements with women. Conflicts that were not to be resolved until the communal life of the Black Panther Party displaced problematic individual relationships. When I was very young, I accepted the institution of marriage. As I grew older and saw my father struggling to take care of a wife and seven children, Having to work at three jobs at once, I began to see that the bourgeois family can be an imprisoning, enslaving, and suffocating experience. Even though my mother and father loved each other deeply and were happy together, I felt that I could not survive this kind of binding commitment with all its worries and material insecurity. Among the poor, social conditions and economic hardship frequently change marriage into a troubled and fragile relationship. A strong love between husband and wife can survive outside pressures, but that is rare. Marriage usually becomes one more imprisoning experience within the general prison of society. My doubts about marriage were reinforced when I met Richard Thorne. This theory of non-possessiveness in the love relationship was appealing to me. The idea that one person possesses the other as in bourgeois marriage, where she's my woman and I and he's my man, was unacceptable. It was too restrictive, too binding, and ultimately destructive to the union itself. Often it observed, absorbed all of a man's energies and did not leave him free to develop potential talents, to be creative, or make a contribution in other areas of life. This argument that a family is a burden to a man is developed in Bertrand Russell's critique of marriage and the family. His observations impressed me and strengthened my convictions about the drawbacks of conventional marriage. As a result of thinking and reading, I decided to remain unmarried. This is a decision I do not regret, although it has caused me pain and conflict from time to time and brought unhappiness to me and some of the women whom I have loved. After I moved out of Poor Boys Hall and had my own apartment, I was involved with several beautiful young women who loved me very much. I love them just as much. For a while, I accepted money and favors from them, but only after I had explained that our relationship probably would not work because I was unprepared to follow the old road. If they wanted to be with me, I told them, they would have to do certain things. I never forced or persuaded them. 
As a matter of fact, I said that in their place, I would not do it at all. I also explained my principle of non-possessiveness. I believe that if I was free, so were they, free to be involved with other men. I told them they could have any kind of relationship they wanted with someone else, but that we had a special relationship that could not be duplicated with any other person, no matter how many people we might be involved with at the same time. This meant freedom for me because I could have three or four relationships at the same time without having to keep one secret from the other. I was living alone and we would all be together at my house at the same time. Richard would bring his friends over too. Together we became almost a cult. We spread our ideas around Oakland City College and Berkeley before group living and communalism became popular. I might even say that this was the sign of the Sexual Freedom League since Thorne went on from this to start that organization. The girls found our experiments unusual and romantic and thought we were very exciting. The main foundation of our relationship was mutual honesty and the elimination of jealousy. Within a given period, Richard and I would sleep with more than one woman to see if they could deal with this without regressing to their old values, which we, in our wisdom, considered outdated and bourgeois as well as mentally unhealthy. Although much, much of this involved a new philosophy about the family, another part of it was exploitative. I was serious about our attempt to question matters through practice, but I also felt that we were taking advantage of the women for practical reasons. Women paid my rent, cooked my food, and did other things for me, while any money I came by was mine to keep. Around this time, I was pulling small-time armed robberies with some of my crime partners. We hid in the parking lots of expensive white clubs, and when the people came out, we took their fur wraps, wallets, rings, and watches. I never wanted to do these things on a large scale. What I wanted was leisure time to read and make love. My idea was to be involved with a number of women, and I was. I look back on this time as a kind of God experience when I was free to do anything I wanted. There was conflict, however, because... While I was exploiting women, I was also fighting some internal, internal values that would not let me alone. Perhaps these arose from the Christian principles that had been instilled in me from birth, perhaps from traditional mores. Still, more likely, the conflict arose out of my desire not to treat another human being as an object. The fact that I found it necessary to explain to women that they were at a disadvantage in their relationship with me indicated that I needed some kind of defense mechanism against the guilt I felt. Still, women made my freedom possible by sacrificing their traditional ideas of husband and family. When I loved many women, only twice did I feel an impulse to marry. Even then, after serious consideration, I could not go through with it. Every time I felt close to a woman, I knew it was time for the relationship to end. No matter how deeply I felt, I could not share her goals if they led to a compromise with society. For a time, I tried the pimping life, but this caused altogether too much inner turmoil. Whenever I pimped a black sister, my mind would be filled with flashes of the slave experience, the racist dogs raping black women. I began to feel that if my conscience would not allow me to pimp black women, perhaps I should pimp white women, the enemy. But when I turned out a white woman and found there was still a crisis of conscience, I realized that I could never pimp for a living. With black women, the feeling was shame because I was selling my sister's body. With white women, the feeling was not shame, but guilt because I was now in the role of the oppressor. I had a weakness for women. Therefore, I could never be harsh with them. I always identified with them and fell in love. I flirted with pimping for only about nine months. It was during the period that I met Dolores. She and I were together for five years until I went to jail after the Odell Lee case. Slowly, and perceptibly, I fell more deeply in love with her than I ever had before. She had certain qualities that set her apart from all the others. She was special, unique. Dolores was a beautiful Afro-Filipino spirit, free spirit child woman who lived with passionate intensity. Life with her was spontaneous, unpredictable, and filled with surprises for she had the unselfconsciousness of an impulsive, impulsive and mischievous child. Sometimes, if I was reading or observed, she would steal up behind me and jump on my back. She loved fighting games and played aggressively. Often, Melvin and I had to retreat from a barrage of small stones that came flying at us, accompanied by triumphant laughter and taunts. 
Yet there was a deeper, more complex side to her nature, for she was a creature of, ga- of great contrast. Dolores had an unusual gift for language and a sensitivity to the nuances and subtleties of words. She composed small poems that, to me, seemed remarkable. They revealed an awareness of the tenuousness of all human involvements and the sense of despair that hovers constantly at the lover's threshold of consciousness. Here's one she wrote for me. Two of us are multitude. Without you, I am dead. I'd rather not be than to be deceived by the one who keeps me alive. In our relationship, there was an intense contradiction. I could live with her, but not in the context of conventional family life. During our five years together, we broke up from time to time, but never for more than three months. Some intense need always drove us back to each other. In spite of her childlike qualities, Dolores was mature in many ways. She was a hard worker and willing to support us. She really understood and accepted my problem. I was in conflict, wanting to do the things that were expected of a man in our society, even trying a couple of times without success. I worked on a construction job once and had a canary for a couple of seasons, but I could not deal with work on a permanent basis. Often I considered marrying Dolores, but to do so meant accepting the conditions necessary to marriage in an oppressive situation. For two people are together as a unit rather than in some haphazard way, a certain amount of security must exist. The event of children, they must sacrifice their time to have that security. I was afraid of that. Many of my contemporaries were getting married in the hope of securing a good job and raising a family. But their marriages soon broke up because it cost so much to live and their jobs were so treacherously menial that all their time was spent grubbing for basic necessities. Their dreams were crushed by the realities of their lives. When I saw myself heading in that direction, I balked. My rejecting marriage and a family I held on to, my freedom, but I lost the intimacy and companionship of a woman, an experience that is probably as great as, perhaps greater than, the freedom I wanted. My inability to make a total commitment led Dolores to disaster. Our years together and our closeness had created a deep dependence in her, although I tried to maintain my own freedom and freedom in various ways. One of these was to see other women. One night, I brought another woman to my parents' home. While we were there, Dolores unexpectedly came over. The other woman and I went out, leaving Dolores there. Finally, about two in the morning, I left my companion and returned to our apartment. Dolores was gone. After some frantic calls, I made one to my cousin who lived nearby. She told me Dolores had taken 40 sleeping pills. I rushed over and found Dolores unconscious. An ambulance came and took her to the hospital. No one knew if... Help had arrived in time. I rushed to the hospital. She was alive. I should have seen the danger. Some of her poems had foreshadowed the self-destructive impulse. One of them in particular had a somber, despairing quality. The pigeons of my conscience make shadows on the wall. The cannibal that lives within my mind leaves no room for the imagination. I regret just this. Let me grab some water. My experience with Dolores reinforced in the end my conviction that the demands two people make upon each other can be crippling and destructive. No matter how much they love each other, the values of our society conspire to add intolerable pressures to a binding relationship. The contradictions inherent in marriage make it all but impossible to survive. These contradictions have been solved by the values of the Black Panther Party and by the party's communal life. The closeness of the group and the shared sense of purpose transform us into a harmonious functioning body, working for the destruction of those conditions that make people suffer. Our unity has transformed us to the point where we have not compromised with the system. We have the closeness and love of a family, the will to live in spite of cruel conditions. Consciousness is the first step toward control of a situation. We feel free as a group. We know what troubles us and we act. Bourgeois values define the family situation in America, give it certain goals. Oppressed and poor people who try to reach these goals fail because of the very conditions that the bourgeoisie has established. This is the dilemma. We need a family because every man and woman deserves the kind of spiritual support and unity a family provides. 
Black people try to reach the goal set by the dominant culture and fail without knowing why. How do you solve the situation? By staying outside the system, living alone? I found that to be an outsider is to be alienated and unhappy. In the party, we have formed a family, a fighting family that is vital unit in itself. We have no romantic and fictional notions about getting married and living happily ever after behind a white picket fence. We choose to live together for a common purpose and together we fight for our existence and our goals. Today we have the closeness, the harmony and freedom that we sought so long. This is part three. Uh, the quote is, we believe that black people will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. Uh, the quote, this quote is going to be from George Jackson, Soledad brother, brother, <laughs> locked in jail within a jail, my mind is still free. What if a person was so oriented that the loss of no material thing could cause him mental disorganization? This is the free agent. Again, that was George Jackson. The section's called Freedom. Jail is an odd place to find freedom, but that was the place I first found mine in the Alameda County Jail in Oakland in 1964. This jail is located on the 10th floor of the Alameda County Courthouse, the huge white building we call Moby Dick. When I was falsely convicted of the assault against Odell Lee, Judge Deaton sent me to there to await sentencing. Shortly after I arrived, I was made a, trust, a trustee, which gave me opportunity to move about freely. Conditions were not good. In fact, the place blew up a few weeks later when the inmates refused to go on eating starches and split pea soup at almost every meal and went on a food strike. I joined them. When we were brought our split pea soup, we hurled it back through the bars all over the walls and refused to lock up in our cells. I was the only trustee who took part in the strike, and because I could move between cell blocks, they charged me with organizing it. True, I had carried a few messages back and forth, but I was not an organizer then, not that it mattered to the jail administration. Trustees were supposed to go along with the establishment and everything, and since I could not do that, I was slapped with the organizing label and put in the hole. What black prison what black prisoners call the soul breaker. I was twenty two years old, and I had been in jail before on various beasts, mostly burglary and petty larceny. My parents were pretty sick of me in my late te teens and the years following, so I had to depend on Sonny Man to come up from Los Angeles or wherever he was to bail me out. Since I had been given to him, he came whenever he could, but sometimes I could not find him. At any rate, I was no stranger to jail by 1964, although I had never been in extreme solitary confinement. Within jail, there are four levels of confinement, the main line, segregation, isolation, and solitary, the soul breaker. You can be in jail and jail, but the soul breaker is your last end of the world. In 1964, there were two of these deprivation cells at the Alameda County Co Courthouse, each was four and a half feet wide by six feet long, by 10 feet high. The floor was dark red rubber tile and the walls were black. If the guards wanted to, they could turn on a light in the ceiling, but I was always kept in the dark and nude. That is part of the deprivation, while the soul breaker is called a strip cell. Sometimes the prisoner in the other cell would get a blanket and put and get a blanket, but they never gave me one. He sometimes got toilet paper too. The limit was two squares. And when he begged for more, he was told no. That is part of the punishment. There was no bunk, no wash basin, no toilet, nothing but bars, but bare floors, bare walls, a solid steel door, and a round hole four inches in diameter and six inches deep in the middle of the floor. The prisoner was supposed to urinate and defecate in this hole. A half gallon milk carton filled with water was my liquid for the week. Twice a day, and always at night, the guards brought a little cup of cold split pea soup right out of the can. Sometimes during the day, they brought fruit, fruit loaf, a patty of cooked vegetables mashed together into a little ball. When I first went in there, I wanted to eat and stay healthy, but soon I realized that there was another trick, because when I ate, I had to defecate. At night, no light came in under the door. I could not even find a hole if I had wanted to. If I was desperate, I had to search with my hand, and when I found it, the hole was always slimy with the filth that had gone in before. I was just like a mole looking for the sun. I hated finding it when I did. After a few days, the hole filled up and overflowed. 
so that I cannot lie down with, without wallowing in my own waste. Once every week or two, the guards ran a hose into the cell and washed out the urine and defecation. This cleared the air for a while and made it all right to take a deep breath. I had been told I could break before the 15 days were up. Most men did. After two or three days, they would begin to scream and beg for someone to come and take them out. And the captain would pay a visit and say, we don't want to treat you this way. Just come out now and abide by the rules and don't be so arrogant. We'll treat you fairly. The doors here are large. To tell the truth, after two or three days, I was in bad shape. Why I did not break, I don't know. Stubbornness, probably? I did not want to beg. Certainly, my resistance was not connected to any kind of ideology or program. That came later. Anyway, I did not scream and beg. I learned the secrets of survival. One secret was the same that Mahatma Gandhi learned to take little sips of nourishment, just enough to keep up one's strength, but never enough to have to defecate until the 15 days were up. That way, I kept the air somewhat clean and did not have the overflow. I did the same with water. Taking little sips every few hours, my body absorbed all of it and did not have to urinate. There was another, more important secret, one that took longer to learn. During the day, a little light showed in the two-inch crack at the bottom of the steel door. At night, as the sun went down and the lights clicked off one by one, I heard all the cells closing and all the locks. I held my hands up in front of my face and soon I could not see them. For me, that was the testing time, the time when I had to save myself or break. Outside jail, the brain is always being bombarded by external stimuli. These ordinary sights and sounds of life help keep our mental processes in order, rational. In deprivation, you have to somehow replace the stimuli, provide an interior environment for yourself. Ever since I was a little boy, I have been able to overcome stress by calling up pleasant thoughts. So very soon I began to reflect on the most soothing parts of my past. Not to keep out any evil thoughts, but to reinforce myself in some kind of rewarding experience. Here I learned something. This was different. When I had a pleasant memory, what was I to do with it? Should I throw it out and get another or try to keep it to entertain myself as long as possible? If you're not disciplined, a strange thing happens. The pleasant thought comes and then another and another like quick cuts flashing vividly across the movie screen. At first, they are organized. Then they start to pick up speed, pushing in on top of one another, going faster, faster, and faster. The pleasant thoughts are not so pleasant now. They are horrible and grotesque caricatures swirling around in your head. Stop, I heard myself say. Stop, stop, stop. I did not scream. I was able to stop them. Now what do I do? I started to exercise, especially when I heard the jangle of keys as the guards came in the split pea soup and fruit loaf. I would not scream. I would not apologize, even though they came every day, saying they would let me out if I gave in. When they were coming, I would get up and start my calisthenics. calisthenics. <laughs> And when they went away, I would start the pleasant thoughts again. If I was too tired to stand, I would lie down and find myself on my back. Later, I learned that my position with my back arched and only my shoulders and tight buttocks touching the floor when a Zen, was a Zen Buddhist posture. I did not know it then, of course. I just found myself on my back. And when the thoughts started coming again, again to entertain me, and when the same thing happened with the speed up faster and faster, I would say stop and start again Pen. yeah do you want to break mm, i'm good what how long have we been reading good question i'll <laughs> tell you right now 24 minutes i so, do you want to break no nah, i'm gonna keep going i'm feeling it okay i appreciate you though appreciate you over a span of time I do not know how long it took. I mastered my thoughts. I could start them and stop them. I could slow them down and speed them up. It was a very conscious exercise. For a while, I feared I would lose control. I could not think. I could not stop thinking. Only later did I learn through practice to go at the speed I wanted. I call them film clips, but they were really thought patterns and the, mo the most vivid pictures of my family, girls, good times. Soon I could lie with my back arched for hours on end, and I placed no importance on the passage of time. Control. I learned to control my food, 
my body, and my mind through a deliberate act of will. After 15 days, the guards pulled me out and sent me back to a regular cell for 24 hours, where I took a shower and saw a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. They were worried that prisoners would become mentally disorganized in such deprivation. Then, because I had not repented, they sent me back to the hold. By then, it held no fears for me. I had won my freedom. Soul breakers exist because the authorities know that such conditions would drive them to the breaking point. But when I resolved that they would not conquer my will, I became stronger than they were. I understood them better than they understood me. No longer dependent on the things of the world, I felt really free for the first time in my life. In the past, I had been like my jailers. I had pursued the goals of capitalist America. Now I had a higher freedom. Most people who know me do not realize that I have been in and out of jail for the past 12 years. They know only of my 11 months in solitary in 1967, waiting for the murder trial to begin, and the 22 months at the penal colony after that. But 1967 would not have been possible without 1964. I could not have handled the penal colony solitary without the soul breaker behind me. Therefore, I cannot tell inexperienced young comrades to go into jail and into solitary, that that is the way to defy the authorities and exercise their freedom. I know that solitary, I know what solitary can do to a man. The strip cell has been outlawed throughout the United States. Prisoners I talked to in California tell me it is no longer in use on the West Coast. That was the work of Charles Gary, the lawyer who defended me in 1968, when he fought the case of Warren Wells, a Black Panther accused of shooting a policeman. The Superior Court of California said it was an outrage to human decency to put any man through such extreme deprivation. Of course, prisons have their ways, and out there right now, somewhere, prisoners without lawyers are probably lying in their own filth in the soul breaker. I was in, actually, uh, that reminds me of a very, I think a story, I think it happened to this brother about a year ago, maybe a little less in Alabama, where the brother, they've discovered his body malnourished and covered with bugs and lice eating his flesh. Sick shit. So yes, even today, especially with prisoners with no advocates, are being just tortured daily. I was in the hole for a month. My sentence, when it came, was for six months on the county farm at San Rita, Santa Rita, about 50 miles south of Oakland. This is an honor camp with no walls, and the inmates are not locked up. There is a double barbed wire fence, but... Anyone can easily walk off during the daytime. The inmates work at tending livestock, harvesting crops, and doing other farm work, slavery. I was not in the honor camp long. A few days after I arrived, I had a fight with a fat black inmate named Bojack, who served in the mess hall. Bojack was a, a diligent enforcer of small helpings, and I was a dipper. Whenever Bojack turned away, I would dip for more with my spoon. One day he tried to prevent me from dipping, and I called him for protecting the oppressor's interests and smashed him with the steel tray. When they pulled me off of him, I was hustled next door to Greystone, the maximum security prison at Santa Rita. Here, prisoners are locked up all day inside a stone building. Not only that, I was put in solitary confinement for the remaining months of my sentence. Because of my experience in the hold, I could survive. Still, I did not submit willingly. The food was as bad in Greystone as it had been in Alameda, and I constantly protested about that and the lack of heat in my cell. Half the time, we had no heat at all. Wherever you go in prison, there are disturbed inmates. One on my block at San Rita could scream night and day as loudly as he could. His vocal cords seemed made of iron. From time to time, the guards came into his cell and threw buckets of cold water on him. Gradually, as the inmate wore down, the scream became a croak, and then a squeak, and then a whisper. Long after he gave out, the sound lingered in my head. The Santa Rita administration finally got disgusted with my continual complaints and protests and shipped me back to the I'm sorry, sent me back to the jail in Oakland, where I spent the rest of my time in solitary. By then I was used to the cold. Even now, I do not like any heat at all whenever I stay, no matter what the outside temperature. Even so, the way I was treated told me a lot about those who devised such punishment. I know them well. Grab some water. Okay. You want me to go to the next one? 
Yeah, please. I got you. All right. So the first new chapter has a different quote at the beginning. This one is by Julian Bond, A Time to Speak, A Time to Act. Steel is an heir to the early organizing efforts of young Blacks and whites in the rural South. He inherits the demands of early 60s students that fundamental constitutional guarantees and promises so long violated by the illegitimate white power be immediately honored while reserving the right to attack the system itself. This one is entitled Bobby Steele. Out of jail and back on the street in 1965, I again took up with Bobby Seal. We, oh, we had a lot to talk about. I had not seen him in more than a year. Bobby and I had not always agreed. In fact, we disagreed the first time we met <laughs> during the Cuban Missile Crisis several years before. Why does it always happen like that? <laughs> um, that was the time that President Kennedy was about to blow humanity off the face of the earth because Western ships were on their way to liberated territory with arms for the people of Cuba. The Progressive Labor Party was holding a really, um, I think that mean, they mean a rally outside of Oakland City College to encourage support for Fidel Castro. I was there because I agreed with their views. There was a number of speakers, and one of them, Donald Warden, launched into a lengthy praise of Fidel. He did this in his usual opportunistic way, tooting his own horn. Warden was about halfway through his routine, criticizing civil rights organizations and asking why we put more money into that kind of thing, when Bobby challenged him, expressing opposition to Warden and a strong support for the people for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He felt that the NAACP was the hope of Black people, and because of this, he supported the, the government and its moves against Cuba. Ooh. I explained to him afterward that he was wrong to support the government and civil rights organizations. Too much money had already been put into legal actions. There were enough laws on the books to permit Black people to deal with all their problems, but the laws were not enforced. Therefore, trying to get more laws was only a meaningless meaningless diversion from the real issues. This was an argument I had heard in the Afro-American Association and in Oakland by Malcolm X, who made the point over and over again. Bobby began to think about this and later came came over to my point of view. Whatever our early disagreements, Bobby and I were close by 1965. Later, I recruited him into the Afro-American Association, but when I left it, he continued to stick with Warden. At that time, I was still going through my identity crisis, looking for some understanding of myself in relation to society. While I took a back seat in the association and refused to even make, to make a stand on any position, Bobby threw all his energy into it, even after I left. Still, We did not establish close contact until I got out of the hole in 1965. At that point, Bobby was planning to get married, and he needed a bed for his new apartment. I was breaking up with my girlfriend and had a bed I no longer wanted. I sold it to him, and we hauled it to his home. That afternoon, we began to talk. He told me that he had left the Afro-American Association to hook up with Cam Frieden and his group, the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM. Most of the brothers in this group attended Oakland City College, but the organization was a sort of underground, off-campus operation. They, they also had a front group called the Soul Students Advisory Council, which was, recognized, which was a recognized campus organization. The RAM group was more intellectual than active. They did a lot of talking about the revolution and also some writing. Writing was almost a requirement for membership, in fact, but Bobby was no, was, was no writer. At the time I got out of jail, Bobby had involved had been involved with an argument with members and has been suspended for some time. Still angry about this, he told me he intended to break up with them. Like me, like thousands of us, Bobby was looking for something and not finding it. Bobby and I entered in a period of intense exploration, trying to find some of the ideological problems with the Black movement. Partly, we needed to explain our own satisfaction why no Black political organ to our own satisfaction why no Black political organization had succeeded. The only th- one we thought had promised long-term success was the organization of Afro-American unity started by Malcolm X. But Malcolm X had died too soon to pull his program together. Malcolm's slogan had been freedom by any means necessary, but nothing we saw was taking us there. We still only had a vague conception of what freedom ought to mean to Black people, except in abstract terms borrowed from politicians, and that did not help the people on the block at all. Those lofty words were meant for intellectuals and the bourgeoisie, who were already fairly comfortable. 
Most of our conversation revolved around groups in the San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley areas. Knowing the people who belonged to them, we could evaluate both positive and negative aspects of their characters and the nature of their organizations. While we respected many of the moves these brothers had made, we felt the negative aspects of the movements overshadowed the positive ones. Amy, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I'll, I'll pick up on the uh, next page or okay. whenever you're ready for me. I got you. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to find my face again. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started throwing around ideas. None of these groups were able to. Oh. Okay, yeah, we started throwing our ideas. None of the groups were able to recruit and involve the very people they profess to represent. The poor people in the community who never went to college probably was not able even to finish high school. Yet these were our people. They were the vast majority of the black population in the area. Any group talking about blacks was in fact <laughs> talking about those who are on the low on ladder in terms of well-being, self-respect, and the amount of concern the government had for them. All of us were talking and nobody was reaching them. Bobby had a talent that could help us. He was beginning to make a name for himself in the local productions as an actor and a comedian. I had seen him act in several plays written by brothers and he was terrific. I had never liked comedians and I would not go out of my way to hear one. <laughs> if a person presents his material in a serious way and uses humor to get his points across, he will have me laughing with all the rest. But stand up. Wisecracking comedians leave me cold. Wake that up, Huey. <laughs> Still, I recognize Bobby's talent, and I thought he could use it in a way to relate to people and persuade them in an incisive way. Often, when we are rapping about our frustrations with particular people or groups, Bobby would act out their madness. He could do expert imitations of President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, <laughs> James Cagney, whoever that is. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart, um, Humphrey Bogart <laughs> the Chester of Gunsmoke. I can pick up here. Okay. You did a really good job. Thank you. Period. <laughs> he could also imitate down to the last detail some of the brothers around us. I would crack my sides laughing, not only because his imitations were so good, but because he could convey certain attitudes and characteristics so sharply. He caught all their shortcomings, the way their ideas failed to meet the needs of the people. <laughs> we planned to work through the Seoul Students Advisory Council. Although SSAC was just a front for RAM, it had one large advantage. It was not an intellectual organization. And for that reason, it would appeal to many lower class brothers at City College. If these brothers belonged to a group that gave them feelings of strength and respect, they could become effective participants. It was important to give them something relevant to do, something not degrading. Soul Students was normally an ineffective and transitory, I said that's wrong as hell, but transitory group w without a real program. Only if something big was happening did their meetings attract a lot of people. In the quiet times, only two or three would show up. Just then, however, Soul Students had a hot issue. The establishment of a program of Afro-American history and culture in the college regular curriculum. Although it was relevant, a relevant program, the authorities were resisting it tooth and nail. Every time we proposed a new course, they countered with reasons why it could not be. At the same time, ironically, they encouraged us to be concerned, in quotes. This was simple trickery. They were dragging their feet. Bobby and I saw this as an opportunity to move soul students a step further by adopting a program of armed self-defense. We of the Afro-American History Program, we appointed out, I'm sorry, we pointed out that this would be a different kind of rally. The soul student members would strap on guns and march on the sidewalk in front of the school. Partly, uh, the rally would express our opposition to police brutality, but it would also intimidate the authorities at City College who were resisting our program. We were looking for a way to emphasize both college and community to draw them together. The police and the school authorities needed a strong jolt from Blacks, and we knew this kind of action would make them realize that the brothers meant business. Carrying guns for self-defense was perfectly legal at the time. We explained all this to Seoul students and showed them that we did not intend to break any laws, but we're concerned that the organizations start dealing with reality rather than sit around intellectualizing and writing essays about the white man. 
We wanted them to dedicate themselves to armed self-defense with the full understanding that this was defense for the survival of Black people in general, and in particular for the cultural program we were trying to establish. As we saw it, Blacks were getting ripped off everywhere. The police had given us no choice but to defend ourselves against no courses dealing with, I'm sorry, to defend ourselves against their brutality. On the campus, we were being miseducated. We had no courses dealing with our real needs and problems, courses that taught us how to survive. Our program was designed to lead the brothers into self-defense before we were completely wiped out physically and mentally. The weapons were a recruiting device. I felt we could recruit Oakland City College students from the grassroots, people who did not relate to campus organizations that were all too intellectual and offered no effective program of action. Street people could relate to Seoul students if they followed our plan. If the, commu if the Black community has learned to respect anything, it has learned to respect the gun. We underestimate the difficulty of bringing the brothers around. We, I'm sorry, Seoul students completely rejected our program. Those brothers have been so intimidated by police firepower, they would not give any serious consideration to strapping on a gun, legal or not. After that setback, we went to the Revolutionary Action Movement. They did not have any members, just a few guys from the college campus who, who talked a lot. We explained that by wearing and displaying weapons, the Street Brothers would relate to Ram's example of leadership. We also talked about a new idea, patrolling the police, since the police were the main perpetrators of violence against the community. We went no further than those two tactics, armed self-defense and police patrol. A more complete program was sure to get bogged down on minor points. I just wanted them to adopt a program of self-defense, and after that was worked out, we could then develop it fully. We were not aiming then at party organizations. There were too many organizations already. Our job was to make one of them relevant. That would be contribution enough. However, we were having a lot of trouble breaking through. Ram rejected the plan too. They thought it was suicidal that we could not survive a single day patrolling the police. This left us where we have been all along, nowhere. And they were so wrong, child. <laughs> so wrong. Mm -hmm. Damn. I really hope I've never done something that is going to have everyone in history be like, damn, bitch, you <laughs> fucked that one up. <laughs> you was definitely wrong about that. Um, <laughs> Do you want me to take the next one? Oh, yeah, please. Okay. Um, chapter 16. Um, this starts with a quote from William Greer and Price Cobbs um, from a book called Black Rage. As the sapling bent low, stores energy for the violent black, for violent backswing, blacks, I'm sorry, the, if you say blacks, always just kills me, but blacks understand it's historical. Uh, blacks bent double by oppression have stored energy which will be released in the form of rage, black rage apocalyptic and final heard you um, chapter 16 the founding of the black panther party all during this time Bobby and I had no thought of the black panther party no plan to heat up any organization and the 10 point program was still in the future we had seen Watts rise up the previous year. We had seen how the police attacked the Watts community after causing the trouble in the first place. We had seen Martin Luther King come to Watts in an effort to calm the people. And we had seen his philosophy of nonviolence rejected. Black people have been taught nonviolence. It was deep in us. What good, however, was nonviolence when the police were determined to rule by force? We had seen the Oakland police and California Highway Patrol begin to carry their shotguns in full view as another way of striking fear into the community. We had seen all this and we recognized that the rising consciousness of Black people was almost at the point of explosion. One must relate to history of one's community and its future. Everything we had seen convinced us that our time had come. Out of this need sprang the Black Panther Party. Bobby and I finally had no choice but to form an organization that would involve the lower class brothers. We worked it out in conversations and discussions. Most of the talk was casual. Bobby lived near the campus and his living room became a kind of headquarters. Although we were still involved in the Soul Students, we attended a few meetings and when we did go, sorry, turning the page, um, Black, Black, ooh, I'm so sorry. Now you're doing okay. our presence. I clicked the wrong thing and it took me um, a couple of pages ahead. 
it says out of this need da, 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 we're tra- oh our presence was mostly disruptive wait that up we raised questions that upset people our conversations with each other became the important thing brothers who had a free hour between classes and others who just hung around campus drifted in and out of bobby's house we drank beer and wine and chewed over the political situation our social problems and the merits and shortcomings of other groups we also discussed the Black achievements of the past, particularly as they helped us to understand current events. In a sense, these sessions at Bobby's house were our political education classes, and the party sort of grew out of them. Even after we formally organized, we continued the discussions in our office. By then, we had moved on to include not only problems, but possible solutions. We also read, the literature of oppressed people and their struggles for liberation in other countries is very large, and we poured over these books to see how our experiences, how their experiences may help us understand our plight. We read the, the work of Franz Fanon, particularly The Russian of the Earth, and the four volumes of Chairman Mao Tse-Sung and Che Guevara's Guerrilla Warfare. Che and Mao were veterans of people's war and they have worked out successful strategies for liberating their people we read these men's work because we saw them as kinsmen the oppressor who had controlled them was controlling us both directly and indirectly we believed it was necessary to know how they gained their freedom in order to go about getting ours however we did not want to merely import india's ideas and strategies we had to transform what we learned into principles and methods acceptable to the brothers on the block Mao and Fanon and Guevara all saw clearly that the people had been stripped of their birthright and their dignity, not by any philosophy or mere words, but at gunpoint. They had suffered they had suffered a hold up by gangsters and rape for them was the only way to hold up by gangster gangsters and rape for them. This was the only the only way to win freedom was to mate force with force. At bottom, this this is a form of self defense. Although the defense may at times take on characteristics of aggression, in the final analysis, the people do not initiate. They simply respond to what has been inflicted upon them. People respect the expression of strength and dignity displays by men who refuse to bow to weapons of oppression. Though it may be mean death, these men will fight because death with dignity is always preferable to ignominity. Ignominity. Mm. I don't know what that means, but I like it. Mm. Then, too, <laughs> um, there was always a chance that the oppressor will be overwhelmed. Do you Fanon... want me to read after this, or you want mm-hmm. to keep going? No, you can go. Okay. You sound mad good, by the way. Ooh. For real. <laughs> no, I'm just like, let me stop. <laughs> Yo, not the lesbian growl. <laughs> Ooh, got me knocking over my water. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Fanon. Not you all what? No. Okay, stop. <laughs> I'm sorry for people in the room. Why are like you like this? Why are you like this? <laughs> Fanon made a statement during the Algerian war that impressed me. He said it was the year of the boomerang, which is the third phase of violence. At that point, the violence of the aggressor turns on him and strikes a killing blow. Yet the oppressor does not understand the process. He knows no more than he did in the first phase and when he launched the violence. The oppressed are always defensive. The oppressor is always aggressive and surprised when the people turn back on him and the force he has used against them. Negroes with Guns by Robert Williams had a great influence on the kind of party we developed. Williams had been active in Monroe, North Carolina, with a program of armed self-defense that had enlisted many in the community. However, I did not like the way he had called the federal government for assistance. We viewed the government as an enemy, the agency of a ruling clique that controls the country. We also had some literature about the deacons for self-defense and justice in Louisiana, the state where I was born. One of their leaders had come through the Bay Area on a speaking and fundraising tour, and we liked what he said. The deacons had done a good job of defending civil rights and mar- civil rights marchers in their area, but they also had a habit of calling upon the federal government to carry out this defense or at least to assist them in defending the people who were upholding the law. The deacons even went so far as to enlist local sheriff and police to defend the marchers with the threat that if law enforcement agencies would not defend them, the deacons would. We also viewed the local police, the National Guard, and the regular military as one huge armed group that oppress the will of the people. In a boundary situation, people have no real defense except what they provide for themselves. 
we read we read also the works of the freedom fighters who had done so much for black communities in the United States. Bobby had collected all of Malcolm X's speeches and ideas from papers like The Militant and Muhammad Speaks. These we studied carefully. Although Malcolm's program for the organization of Afro-American Afro unity was never put into operation, he, he made it clear that Blacks ought to arm. Malcolm's influence was ever present. We continue to believe that the Black Panther Party exists in the spirit of Malcolm. Often, it is difficult to say exactly how an action or a program has been determined or influenced in a spiritual way. Such intangibles are hard to describe, although they can be more significant than any precise influence. Therefore, the words on this page cannot convey the effect that Malcolm has had on the Black Panther Party, although, as far as I'm concerned, the party is a living testament to his life's work. I do not claim that the party has done what Malcolm would have done. Many others say that their programs are Malcolm's programs. We do not say this, but Malcolm's spirit is in us. For all of these things, the books, Malcolm's writing and spirit, our analysis of the local situation, the idea of an organization was forming. One day, quite suddenly, almost by chance, we found a name. I had read a pamphlet about voter registration in Mississippi, how the people in Longdale's County had armed themselves against establishment violence. Their political group called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization had a Black Panther for its symbol. A few days later, while Bobby and I were rapping, I suggested that we use the Panther as a symbol and call our political vehicle the Black Panther Party. The Panther is a fierce animal, but he will not attack until he is backed into a corner. Then he will strike out. The image seemed appropriate and Bobby agreed without discussion. At this point, we knew it was time to stop talking and begin organizing. Although we had always wanted to get away from the intellectualizing and rhetoric char characteristic of other groups, at times we were as inactive as they were. The time had come for action. Now this is uh, section he did that. <laughs> he did that. That was a very good, that was a good, it, I like the way he bounces around from topic to topic, but ultimately connects them. Yeah, that was a good section. You want to stop there? Oh, I thought we were stopping at an hour. That it's been an hour, cool. But we could, but we could keep going. No, nah, that's cool. I think keeping them like these reading spaces about an hour has been like convenient for a lot of people going to the playback. So, no, nah, good looking out. Yeah, this was really good. I I can't wait to talk to you about um what he was saying about all his girlfriends. Yeah, I it. <laughs> oh my god, he was being so cutely problematic. <laughs> He's not shit. Oh my god, I was re as I was reading, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I feel like it's always so useful to remember that these is just niggas. Like you know how me and you just had like that little break to be like, mm -hmm. you know, they was doing the same thing. They exactly. Was, like they was. You know, oh, so. I thought that's what you wanted to talk about. I didn't know you wanted to like talk about his. I thought you were like, oh, I see where you got it from type shit. I thought that's oh. what you were going to be on. <laughs> oh, no, you reformed. <laughs> you, <laughs> you've been born again. So <laughs> I wasn't talking about you. I wouldn't do that to you on a recorded space. Come on, though. Hi, Miss Dancing Tree. Hi, How you hi. been? Hello. And, hello. Can you hear me? My, my, voice, is, yes, my voice is a little weak. I was just um thinking about the, uh, the wider context in which he writes this thing. Um, remember, they're, they're, this is written in the midst of the so-called sexual revolution. So there's this much wider context of the so-called sexual revolution going on. The birth control pill has been released in 1966 and people, it, everything started to change. So it was not that he was single-handedly or solitarily moving into questioning um, traditional bourgeois marriage. There was a much wider context of that that had been going on since the folk song movement of the early 1960s. It began at the end of the folk revival of the early 1960s. That's where you began to see it. Probably 1963, 64, somewhere in there. And then it catapults into a much wider sexual revolution. So his statements are set in that context. I just want to want to add that in there because 
having to live through that period of time. And I can just see it now. It was being debated in all of the black nationalist circles and in all of the so-called progressive circles and in all of the circles on the left. People were debating this question of, of a traditional bourgeois marriage. But I think there was something much broader going on because it was being questioned across the board, even by people who are not so-called progressives. And I think they were questioning it because you begin to see the very beginnings of deindustrialization. That's when deindustrialization sprouts. And you begin to see, oh, maybe one or two factories have left the neighborhood. And it gradually increases until it starts to peak in the early 70s when you really just see a mass fleeing. And so I think that what happens is this is the very beginnings of the questioning the traditional form upon which it was contingent upon the person working. And this, in this case, hard industry is what was responsible for the cash flow among the working classes across the board. Literally, that movement was financed by the black auto workers and steel workers in places like Gary, Indiana, and Detroit, and Chicago, and St. Louis, and Pittsburgh, in those hard industries of rubber, you know, in Akron, Ohio, Toledo. That fueled so much success and so much, okay, so it, not only that, there, there was also a much wider questioning of capitalism generally because of its international failure, especially after the, there was a big revival of leftism after World War II um, because we were partnered with the people that are now so-called enemies, the Russians, the Soviets, against the Nazis. And so there was a very different reception of the left. But anyway, I just want to put that in context for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Because like you said, you lived it. And so we, we definitely need that experience and that wisdom. I'm really happy that you're in this space. I want to touch on too that the conversation of marriage and like how it works under white supremacist capitalist system, that's still going on in the left, like how to approach relationships and, you know, if it could be radical under those constraints, like a lot of us are wrestling with that. So it's, it's really interesting that we read that today and to have more conversations about it, like, I guess in spaces would probably be more helpful and especially to analyze things because we tend to want to start like, oh, this is what we need to do. It needs to be a two parent household and that, and they're trying to break up the family. And then that's it. And it's so limiting and it's like widen it out. Cause actually we're having even worse problems. Like people are questioning like, damn, I can't even afford to feed myself. Like, how am I going to be able to have a partner and how are we going to be able to have a life? Because even if we do come together to, you know, split the bills, right? Most of our days are going to be spent laboring, toiling, working, and being exploited. And then on the job, the culture on the job of whiteness is so suffocating, so dehumanizing, it strips you of your dignity. And then you're pretending all day in order to keep your job because you got to you gotta hope they don't fire you. Because if you don't, you know, play along, if you don't go to the luncheons, if you don't answer the invasive questions, well, guess what? Now you're hard to work with. Now you're difficult. And now you don't get your raise or you get fired. So all this game that you play and then you got to go home, you're drained emotionally, you're stomped all over. And what do you have to offer to your partner? Like love dies under these conditions. And that's why, again, we wrestle with, well, shit, how do we be able to have like love survive and be radical? Because again, too, you don't want to go home and then have to pretend for your partner, but you kind of do because you're like, well, damn, you're going through the fire. I'm going through the fire. We come together and, like, where does happiness happen? And then how do we pretend to be happy when New York is flooded? <laughs> like, I can go on and on about this shit. But yeah, it's just that we do uh, often wrestle with this and we should, because I don't think relationships, good ones, radical ones, can look the way that capitalism has sold us. Well, you know, it, it has had a real influence, that's for sure, um, on the whole coupling routine. Um, but, what, you know, you wrestle with this thing. And, and when I was, before I was too old to think about getting married, and I thought about getting married, we were wrestling with this same question. Um, and 
what one of the things that we kind of came up with, I think made sense, but didn't discover it soon enough is two people have to, or three, whatever number, have to, first of all, agree that their union is not based on romantic love. That's not to say romantic love isn't involved, but that they have to reckon that it is not based on that, that it is based on something much, much broader than an individual's emotional whim called love, this emotional state of the individual, that that coupling has to be governed by some real material circumstances, some real needs. And those two people come together to fulfill that need and make that unit, which is a much stronger, a much more successful, has a much longer <coughs> longevity. <coughs> Excuse me. There, <coughs> there are all kinds of real reasons why living with someone and feeling a commitment to someone extends your life. People who do it are much healthier. They live longer. I mean, that's statistically borne out. So there are some real reasons, and people have to come together as a cooperative unit and use very, very rational conditions, first and foremost. That is the real basis, because after a certain number of years, if you are really in a committed relationship with somebody, and I'm talking about for the long haul, I ain't talking about for five years. I ain't talking about for 10 years. I'm talking about this the motherfucker gonna bury you or you gonna bury them from old age. That's what I'm talking about. So this is somebody you're gonna have to pull literal existence with for the next potentially 50 to 60 or more years. How do you support each other? How do you help sustain each other as a unit and any other individuals that you bring into that unit through birth, marriage, or adoption, however you do it, and they become part of that family. That's what's at the basis of the formation of the family from the beginning of human history. This thing called romantic love is very, 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 very new in human history and is a wonderful piece of work by Morton Hunt called The Natural History of Love that looks at the development of that psycho-emotional state where you get the butterflies in your stomach and you get excited. I've been in love a lot of times. I love falling in love. That shit feel good. You know, it's exciting. If my panties stay wet when I'm in love, right? It's a great emotional state, but it's not the place to constitute a lifelong commitment in which that person will help sustain your life and you will help sustain theirs. And people have to start seeing that institution for what it was designed for. But this is only my outsider view, having been married twice. So, you know, from the time I was in my early 30s until my last husband died in my 60s, so for 30 years, I was married to somebody. And after a while, all that emotional stuff starts to dull, and you got to deal with what you got. Now what you got, you know, I had a carpenter and a plumber and a blah, 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 and somebody that I was glad to have around, whether I was in love with him or not. And that's what it turns into. And then if you have, like, children that you raise together, so now you both did him printed on this kid, it becomes a whole different ball game. And you are molding the psychological health and well-being of another human being. And you got a choice to some extent what you're going to produce. And this is a very serious business, you know. And I hate that we've taken it and commercialized it and turned it into Brides Magazine. And, you know, oh, I'm going to have this big wedding and I'm so in love, baby. And all of that works and all that's nice. And I'm not saying people shouldn't do that. They should do whatever they want to do and whatever, they, whatever feels good. But they should really, in order for that thing to be successful, They've got to face a reality about that partnership that goes above and beyond this emotional state. If you're in for the long haul, and if this is going to be the person that is co-parenting your children. 
because they're imprinting on them too. So, I don't think people take it seriously enough and because they get caught up in the various models. Two adults can determine whatever they want to determine going forward in any kind of relationship they want to build. The thing is that they lack honesty because we get all clouded with love and commitment and you don't do me wrong, baby, and, you know, all of that stuff that goes with it. When at the bottom of this thing is real survival. You know, you come home and somebody done already cooked and that shit smell good in the kitchen. You're so happy you got somebody there, right? You wake up and, wow, somebody done took out the trash all over the house. Yeah, God damn, I'm glad somebody else is up in here with me. Yeah. You know, it comes down to that. It comes down to protection. And this is the person that will probably end up making your funeral right. You know, if y'all go that far. So, you know, when it says, when, when it notes contemporary marriage vows, it says, it is not to be entered into lightly. <laughs> but nobody take that seriously till they get into it. And they say, oh, I see, said the blind man. You do get treated differently, you know, once you become a couple. <laughs> Does it ever? <laughs> anyway, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, you bring up a good point about like approaching unions with like attention, which means having some real ass conversations. Like, what is the politic of a person? Like, what is their politics on children in a society and how they're treated? That would be important. Like, you brought up co parenting. Like, if we don't challenge these things, but if we just join together and just try to, like, you know, assimilate into the system and think that everything's okay, we just have to work hard and then shit will work out. What kind of union is that? And is it even fulfilling? And is it transformative? I think that it you like answered and touched on a question I've been wrestling with on what is radical love and what does it look like? Like in all things in my life, I want to connect with someone who is on that type of time too, a challenging, not just the status quo, but all the things that we've been indoctrinated with and want to dismantle that and have something different than what we've been sold and deeper. So no, I think you touched on all of it, Ms. Danson Tree. Appreciate you. Yeah, I really like how he uses the word concession because it is a concession to the state. It's a trusting in the state that the state will be the arbiter, arbiter of your marriage or your love life or your personal life. So if you're, if you want to live your life th as a fugitive, the way, you know, he like a revolutionary has to go into the state for like that personal thing doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, unless, right. It's part of that larger vision um, that we were talking about. And um, I think it's, it's powerful to reckon with because there are some things that you do for a means to an end, which is like why I feel like a lot of people that I know got married. Um, I've never been married, but I know people who have got married for like um, healthcare reasons, for immigration reasons. Usually it's some type of like, you know what I'm saying? Like some type of like material need that needs to be met which really like kind of brings us back to like what bell hooks was saying is like how what is love under capitalism when everything is transactional including the very institution of marriage um yeah now i'm just thinking and talking go ahead Pen. no you i'm glad you brought up the part about concession to the state because even on a way where oh you said something that triggered me oh you said conceding to the state like making them like the arbiter of like marriage and union. And then what that looks like. Well, I was, it, my mind automatically went to what it, was, it looked like culturally. Because in order to sustain that, there has to be like um, a hierarchy. Well, they tell us, right? There has to be a hierarchy. And that depends on your gender. And then, then what ends up happening is someone has to submit, meaning someone has to be without. And someone has to be looked down upon and beneath and their work devalued. And then all of that creates such a toxic environment when we just follow that, that why would we blindly choose to just follow that, you know, image or that structure that they're selling us that doesn't work. You know, you had what in the fifties when those housewives would try to, you know, live the suburbia lifestyle of a step for a wife and they were addicted to pills called mommy little helpers. And that was the norm. 
or like how they had ice cream trucks running around the neighborhood giving lobotomies to housewives and shit because it was not conducive to a healthy mental state like it was sick it was soul crushing but instead of like challenging it and changing it for it to suit like the communal needs of the person and the people instead they they conceded to the state and conceded to the status quo and and white culture and white society and just gave into dysfunction and then just putting a dress on it with some heels and try to call it normal. Yeah, I don't want that at all. So yeah. Can I say something about life in the 50s? Because I can remember clearly back to 1951. And that was definitely the stereotype and the model that's given and that came across. But that was not the dominant model in America in any community, not even among white folks. That was some fantasy out of Hollywood. Just as the suburbia began in, in after World War, World War II, right around the time the Korean, so-called Korean conflict got started, you started to get the real development of so-called suburbia. And there, there was a stereotype that developed, and there was to some extent a type of suburban housewife. Um, but they were usually the new up and comers who's who was they were probably the first generation to be fully assimilated as white people. I'm talking about that first generation of Jews that become white in America after World War II, that first generation of Italians. So and that have absolutely lost the culture of the old world, don't speak the language and just are sort of ethnic identified when they say so and really in no other way. They began they were assimilated, pretty well assimilated. And around the same time, remember, this great migration is going on. And black folks are moving into industry. And they're moving into these neighborhoods that in almost every location borderlined a white ethnic neighborhood of aspiring people to move into the suburbs. And so as soon as they could move into a suburban community right outside of where the traditional working class was occupying, they did so. But that was largely a stereotype. There was some of that. But I don't know any of the kids that I grew up with whose daddies, well, first of all, everybody had a daddy in the house. I don't know, I only know two people that didn't have a daddy, and their daddies was killed in the, in, in, in the Korean War. So other than that, everybody had a daddy, and everybody's daddy had a job of some kind. So I don't know anybody's daddy who didn't come home and was liable to cook after he spent the day on the construction site. I know my daddy did, especially if there was beef stew to be made. He's the one that always made it. And there were other dishes that only he cooked. And he would come home and from the construction site, having worked all day, my mama not having worked at all, because I was a small child, about five, six years old, and she was staying home with me and cook. So to some extent, that male dominance is something that was among the, that aspiring middle class of first generation immigrants. The, the Archie Bunker stereotype, that really existed. And those were the people that gave us that first big hump of suburbanites. But that whole stereotype is just what it was. Now, the problem was not so much that women were physically or psychologically submissive to any dude or even in their own homes. There were laws that forbid women from doing certain things. For example, if you were a woman and you had a bank account and only your signature was on it, your husband could come and take the money out of your bank account. In many instances, especially if you were in a small town, if the man had a bank account and without the woman's name on it, she could also do the same thing especially if the couple was known in the bank. But a man could legally take his woman's money if they were legally married. He could take, and in many cases that they were common law married, he could take her money out of the bank. In Massachusetts, I know you could do it. In Ohio, you could do it. In many, many places it was legally done. So there were laws that forced women to th into a Hold on. I want to get the exact term here. 
because it was not so much the relationship of women to men as much as it was the relationship of women to the state. Once the state began to lift its restrictions, then the material life of women was transformed in their daily relationships with, with the men that they confronted on a daily basis, their brothers, their husbands, their nephews, their neighbors, you know, the dudes next door, the guys you're going out with, the bloody blah, 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 all of that began to be transformed. So it was more of a woman's relationship with the state that was oppressive than some guy trying to make you walk three paces behind him or you want me to be the boss and who wear pants in the family. That was, I can't ever remember that being a conversation. So I have a question. Yeah. So if the state makes it a law in which a man can take your money, wouldn't the men then have to take your money for that to be a problem? Say that again. So, there, so what I'm saying is it is, it is both. Like, because when you were talking about everyone had a daddy, well, I can go in my own family at that time and tell you that that's not true with anyone that lives not only in, that grew up around the Houston area, but also in the South and all across Mississippi. My whole family were a bunch of like single moms and dad and the men had like five different families and yeah. also wielded their power that the state afforded them. So like, and then they would tell you about like the houses of the women that they would go clean in suburbia where they would talk about how they would take mommy little helpers and get lobotomies and be in this restrictive uh, culture. So the stereotype existed, but it was also reality. And then people also wrote about like yeah. why these things were so toxic. So the thing is, is that we can't give an honest critique if we always want to constantly paint this picture that, oh, no, it wasn't really that bad. It was just the state. Well, yeah, the state can make a law, but who enforces it within your community? Yeah. And if it's getting enforced, then we have a problem, because why would people enforce the state against each other and causing intercommunity turmoil? Yeah, the daily relationship did take on the tone of the state. I'm not saying that it didn't happen at all. Um, but remember that people, especially women in our daily lives, had uh, lots of ways to circumvent some of that crap. Um, yeah, yeah, there were certain things that women did to circumvent some of that. Um, and it, the reason, too, to be honest, right, is because we see a lot of it circling back today and being recycled. That whole aesthetic of uh, the stereotype, but also the lived experience and reality of the people in that time that did go through that. We see that being circled back today as the fix all to be all to like our community ills. Like, oh, if you would just go back to the way grandma and grandma did it, everything would be all right. And we're like, well, grandma talked about how that nigga used to punch her in the throat every day. I don't think we want to no, go back. Wants so, to go yeah, back. so when we're not, yeah, so when we're not honest, right, they're able to resell us the same tricks that worked back then and now. And now we're fighting with the same shit to where it's getting to, it's escalating now, right? Now we're seeing, like, not only the toxicity being reinforced and incentivized under this patriarchal white supremacist capitalist system and being sold to them as, like, oh, this is actually the good way to do it. And if you would just, you know, be quiet more, post a picture of your plate, have you cooked for your man today? Type shit is all tied to that repackaging of that toxic shit that we don't challenge enough. And then also, too, we also see that when that comes back in ways, we see the violence against women also rises and debates on whether it should be considered violence i.e. Rhoda being hit with a brick and everyone had everything to say and even believed the white supremacist that it didn't well, happen. That, that's so the, yeah, that's honestly, it's, it's really important. It's is going to increase, unfortunately. With participatory actors, which will be people in our community as well. And that the reason why people did have defenses against them because they recognized the problem and said, yo, we have a problem that exists here. We need to defend ourselves from not only the state but also intercommunity violence. And in order to reform that violence, we have to become organized, politically educated and dismantle those systems. And to understand that as a community, we cannot side with the state in any way, shape or form, whether it's for any kind of gain at the expense of our people or in detriment to our families and the way we relate to each other. How, and unfortunately people are not choosing to do that. Tell me how this is being recycled today among younger people how is it be, how is so, it being framed so it's kind of it's being framed this whole uh i remember i brought up about the whole plate deal like have you cooked for your men today well if you just read that on his face you're going to be like well what's wrong with that but it's tied to this whole weird aesthetic that they're trying to shop like on youtube and all that of the 
submissive woman who doesn't think about politics, who doesn't get engaged with politics, who doesn't think critically about her life and her positions. Her wants mean nothing. She doesn't, she shouldn't ask for orgasm because only fast women want that. Um, you just have babies, all the babies do not use birth control because that's against God's will. Let everything happen, happen. And that's how it's being, being regurgitated now. And they're called aesthetics, literally whole sh campaigns marketed and pushed upon different social media platforms. And people are eating it up because people are I isolated, alienated, and lonely and wondering, well, why can't I, why can't I connect with people? Why don't I have community? And what happens is, is when they go on YouTube and see this aesthetic pushed upon them or TikTok, they think, oh,